Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will be focusing on a new book by Princeton University political scientist, G. John Eikenberry, entitled A World Safe for Democracy, Liberal Internationalism and the Crisis of the Global Order, published by Yale University Press just several weeks ago. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the seminar and director of the National History Center of the American Historical Association. The seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the AHA's National History Center. And for the past 10 years, the seminar has been meeting weekly, usually if not always on Mondays. And since we're unable to meet in person in the nation's capital, we have migrated online to this webinar format. Behind the scenes are two people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. I'd also like to thank two institutional supporters, the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and the George Washington University Department of History, as well as a number of anonymous donors whose ranks we invite you to join. My co-chair, Christian Osterman, has turned over that role today to his colleague, Robert Litvak, Senior Vice President and Director of International Security Studies at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and I should add has served on the National Security Council staff as Director for Nonproliferation in the first Clinton administration. And he's the author of Rogue States and US Foreign Policy, Outlier States, and most recently, Preventing North Korea's Nuclear Breakout and a number of other works. I'm delighted to be co-chairing co today's session with Rob. One last point on logistics. Please be aware that our session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer section of this webinar, we ask those with questions to use the raise hand function on Zoom. When we call on you, please be ready to unmute yourself. And to those watching on Facebook Live, you can email questions to rweekly at historians.org. We'll try to call on as many folks as we can. And with that, I will turn over the screen now to my co-chair, Rob Litvak, who will introduce today's guest and begin the conversation. Rob. Thank you, Eric. Um, thanks to my colleague, Christian Osterman. This is just an extraordinary series of meetings that are uh, conducted under, under the auspices of, of the American Historical. And we're so appreciative of this collaboration. I thank Christian for letting me uh, um, sit in his usual chair uh, to um, uh, be serve as a discussant uh, that is a moderator with, with John Eikenberry in today's conversation uh, about his new book, uh, A World Safe for Democracy. John, I think, really needs no introduction uh, to this audience. Um, he's a professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton University. He has, with reason, been called the preeminent theorist of, of liberal internationalism. And the book that we'll be discussing today with him, his latest book published by Yale University Press, uh, is A World Safe for Democracy. It is the third in a series of books that he's written, um, the first of which was written or completed at the Wilson Center when John was a fellow, um, After Victory, a brilliant book, um, which really answered one of the riddles of the post-Cold War era. Like, if you're a realist, you would have expected the whole world to have balanced against American power. A lot of us were focused on that, why that didn't occur. John provides, I think, a brilliant uh, answer to why that did not come to pass, linked to his overall theory that we're going to thesis that we're going to hear a lot more about today about the embedding of American power uh, in institutions and norms. Wilson was very proud to have supported uh, through John's fellowship at the Wilson Center uh, that book. Uh, after Victory was followed by Liberal Leviathan, um, another a landmark publication and today's book uh, completing uh, this trilogy, though who knows the door may be open for a fourth volume is a world uh, safe for democracy. John uh, finished this book last year uh, while a fellow at All Souls College at Oxford, which is the preeminent, among the preeminent uh, colleges at, at Oxford where he was uh, in residence uh, working on this manuscript. Um, with that introduction, um, let me begin, um, I think, at, at an appropriate starting point, John. Your book begins with a focus on the, quote, current crisis, close quote, of the US-led uh, liberal international order. But it spends a lot of time looking back at the liberal international order of the last 200 years. 
What led you to look back and, quote, take the long view, close quote, of the arc of the liberal era? Thanks, Rob, and thanks, Eric, for uh, inviting me here and to hosting this event uh, and to talk about this new book. And thank you, Rob, for that, that question. I think the book began really as a series of lectures at the University of Virginia uh, in November of uh, 2016. Uh, and very soon, with the topic of the current crisis of liberal order, you are faced with, with deeper questions, really world historical questions about uh, not just the moment and the specific uh, actors in Washington or elsewhere who are making decisions, but the broader uh, a, a m a moment that we're in uh, uh, as, a, as a global system. And so great questions are being asked. Uh, what is the nature of international order? Uh, this is a moment where people are going back to the classics, asking the, the, the core questions of, of international relations, reading Morgenthau, Carr, Polanyi, uh, and uh, uh, classic uh, things in the liberal tradition. What is the nature uh, of, the, of the liberal democratic project of, of liberal democracy? Uh, can capitalism and representative government be reconciled or brought back into, into, into balance? And what is the future of the liberal internationalist way of organizing the world? What, what are its prospects? What, and and on, sort of on what ground can we plant the flag of liberal internationalism? So in, in those, with those questions in mind, I, I have taken the long view and look back over the last two or two and a half centuries, really, to, to the, the evolution and, uh, and, uh, and um, the transformation, if you will, of liberal internationalism, making the argument that, that the liberal project or liberal order did not begin in 1989 or really even in 1945, but that it's had a longer arc of a kind of jagged history uh, of, of golden eras and crises. Um, uh, the post-1989 uh, era is in some sense an anomaly that the earlier periods are much more uh, uh, agonistic moments of, of struggle, of close run things, uh, uh, particularly in the 1930s and 40s. And indeed the, the book that, that, that sort of set the stage for, for my for my own project, uh, one of them at least, was Ira Katz Nelson's great book, Desolation and Enlightenment, that looks back at the liberals after World War II who were picking up the pieces then, uh, who were in their generation trying to figure out what liberalism, what liberal democracy could do in the aftermath of what was an avalanche of, 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 of violence and illiberalism, the totalitarianism, fascism, uh, uh, the total war uh, of, of World War II, the Great Depression, the Holocaust, the atomic bomb. And so in some sense, I've been inspired to, 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 to look back and see that kind of larger history. And in doing so, I, I, just to finish answering your question, uh, there have been several different goals of this book. One is, is to get that larger history, that genealogy and the lineages of the of the liberal project. We've been here before. This is not uh, something that is, is, is utterly new, that, that we've, we've been through moments like this before. Um, uh, secondly, in doing so, to, to convey a sense of the deeper roots, the kind of historical gravitas of liberal internationalism, uh, sitting alongside other great traditions such as realism. Uh, and beyond that, trying to be honest about its accomplishments and, and failures to kind of uh, uh, draw a balance sheet of over these uh, decades and centuries, what has worked, what hasn't, how has it evolved, what has it, what has it as a project or as a movement learned. And then finally, to, to in some sense recast liberal internationalism as not an idealist tradition that uh, in some sense wants to make the world better, but wants to, uh, to develop uh, um, ways, kind of pragmatic uh, uh, agreements and a building order so that liberal democracy can survive. So to return to its more uh, core, agonistic, pragmatic, world-weary roots and thereby giving more grist and substance to a tradition that obviously, as you suggest, is in a crisis, but that, as I argue, uh, still uh, deeply 
uh, relevant to how we navigate the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the book's title is taken from Woodrow Wilson's famous phrase, to make the world safe for democracy. But you think the phrase has a different meaning uh, than what is commonly understood as a project to promote democracy around the world. How do you see this phrase? Uh, that's, uh, I did use the phrase for Wilson and in many ways it is the, if you were to kind of distill the essence as people understand it uh, and as it in some sense has been handed down uh, from Wilson's day, the, a world safe for democracy in his famous uh, uh, war speech uh, to, the, to the Congress uh, has been understood as this uh, a kind of call to spread democracy to all distant shores, a kind of uh, a, a kind of crusade kind of uh, aspect to to liberal internationalism, and of course that's there. And and I would say at the outset, liberal internationalism is a huge, a sprawling tradition, uh, and indeed uh, arguments are often uh, who's in and who's out: neoliberals or neoconservatives. Are they in or out? And the, the contestation from within and certainly contestation with rival traditions, realism and critical uh, theory and uh, further further left kind of revisionist critiques of liberalism are all out there. And uh, I often think uh, it, with Tacitus' uh, the description of, of the Roman Empire, uh, uh, rich in vicissitudes is, is equally relevant to, to the liberal and the liberal international tradition. But what Wilson is, is famous for arguing, or at least that's the, the implication people have taken from this phrase is this, this uh, effort to, to, to spread uh, uh, the freedom agenda, if you will, uh, uh, worldwide. But in a, in a second reading, uh, it can be seen more literally as trying to make the world safe for liberal democracy. So in, it's, it's that deeper sense of trying to create a, a kind of international framework so that liberal democracies as they have evolved over these various uh, centuries can find a way to, to solve their problems and survive. So a much more conservative, if you will, sense of trying to create a, a, a framework, a, an egg carton for eggs, a, a terranium for, for orchids that are, are, are fragile in some sense, that you need to have an environment to manage your mutual relations with liberal democracies. Liberal democracy, if, if you sort of take the, the political tradition, is, is built around tensions and contradictions and values, liberal uh, liberty and equality, uh, individualism and community, sovereignty and interdependence. And in many ways, the liberal international project is one of creating order. It's an order building project for creating institutions and arrangements uh, so that these liberal democracies can can find ways to balance and trade off their different, their different, uh, their different uh, um, uh, values, and so there is a kind of deep uh, sense of of, of 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 liberal democracy as a as a world historical movement to make a more perfect to build a more perfect union, a kind of sense of a project that unfolds over decades and centuries, uh, each generation passing on to the next generation, um, uh, uh, the kind of uh, activities that we associate with liberal internationalism uh, tied around core convictions about the, how the world works. So it's that kind of um, a sense of, of liberal internationalism in its uh, core as a pragmatic, uh, opportunistic um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, agenda that's aimed at trying to make liberal democracy safe in a world that often has other things in mind. Okay. So just following on that, if you were to distill the essence of liberal internationalism, and you mentioned there are different, there are variants within under that broad rubric, but for you, what is the essence of liberal internationalism? How would you define it? Yeah, um, I would say it's a tradition of thinking and acting in international relations that emerge with the rise of liberal democracies. And it's in some sense, their ideas and projects for building international order so as to um, uh, survive the storms of modernity. So just to kind of illuminate or elaborate that point, in some ways, uh, 
liberal internationalism has been defined by its its other, if you will, its rival uh, uh, realism. And, and realism is often defined as a, a, a way of thinking about international relations, both ideas about how the world works and how you should operate in the world, uh, 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 oriented around the problems of anarchy. And, and in some ways, what I'm arguing in this book is that liberals uh, also care about anarchy, the fact that states are competitive and often uh, don't wish each other well, but that there's also a, a, another phenomenon associated with the modern world, uh, modernity itself, growing um, uh, uh, economic and security interdependence of modern societies driven by science, technology, industrialism, and that that uh, phenomenon has been at the heart of what liberal democracies are oriented to, the finding solutions to, well, global warming, uh, uh, growing uh, problems of, of, of violent capacity, the proliferation of weapons, uh, um, uh, um, and uh, you might say uh, the current uh, issue of our life today, pandemics, uh, all of these problems of interdependence that uh, are shared worldwide, but that liberal democracies have both a special capacity to, to um, work together. Liberal democracies have a special capacity to to cooperate among themselves as like-minded states. And historically, they have found a uh, common cause to build order and to rebuild order after crises that create a kind of uh, nucleus around larger forms of cooperation can be, can be extended uh, worldwide. So that's where I would put the, the kind of the, the center or the bullseye of the liberal international tradition. Well, um, that's clarifying. You, you, sp you speak about Wils of Wilson, but you also argue in the book that actually FDR and uh, the revolution of liberalism in the 1930s and 40s is where we should look for inspiration. I mean, you kind of play down uh, Wilson. Uh, and why is that? I think that sort of follows on, like you just laid out what you've used major tenets of, of liberalism, uh, uh, liberal internationalism, and now sort of like linking that up with the major political figures of, of the 20th century, you said that FDR is more of a guide than, than Wilson. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, the first point I would make is that you know, in addition to kind of this framing of the problems of modernity are what unite liberals across the different eras, uh, the, the rise of liberal internationalism is in some sense tied to to what in the 19th century were really kind of uh, disparate types of, of internationalism, the, the free trade movement, uh, the peace movement, the parliamentary assembly movement, the, the uh, uh, arbitration movement uh, led by jurists and others, um, uh, and functional movements of, of regulating what, what is becoming global capitalism. These kind of came together and Wilson uh, in some sense, was was the end of the 19th century more than the beginning of the 20th century, in my view. That he mm -hmm. he 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 was not a, a, an intellectual innovator in the tradition of liberal internationalism, but he gave voice to it. He gave, he, he provided a kind of synthetic bundling of those those views, and he he made it a, a political project, something that uh, uh, had a kind of movement quality to it. Um, but in a strange sense, he. Uh, saw uh, the, 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 the liberal democratic prospect actually quite uh, as quite, he was quite sanguine really about uh, liberal democracy uh, uh, building and becoming kind of the, the embodiment of what would become the modern world. So civilization and the term civilization for him was similar to the term, what we would call modernization. And he saw it as a global process that in some sense the, the deck was uh, uh, stacked in favor of liberal democracy. And so he saw the project of building international order as using the, the good news about liberal democracy as a source to, uh, as the kind of source of glue for building a new type of international order. By the 30s and 40s, everything had, had, had gone, gone sideways. And uh, the 30s and 40s, starting with the Great Depression and the, the rise of, of illiberal great powers that were harnessed with all the technologies of modernity to do great damage and, and to, to engage in great uh, uh, aggression. And uh, in that era, 
Roosevelt, in some sense, saw the problem of, of liberal democracy and international order in the opposite uh, sense, that it was the international order that would provide the glue to hold liberal democracies together. And what you see in the 30s and 40s is first domestically, the New Deal and the and other versions of, of kind of the looking for a new way to solve problems of industrial society that occurred elsewhere in the world. You, there was a kind of expansion really of the vision of what, what liberal democracy needed to do, the kind of rights and protections that, that societies had to, had to build for each for themselves and the kind of container, if you will, international container that would be needed to uh, house these much more both um, uh, 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 vulnerable liberal democracies and liberal democracies that were now uh, more ambitious about what they wanted to do, providing welfare and security for larger parts of the population. So this kind of double movement uh, was was deeply profound and and uh, innovative for thinking in the in the Roosevelt era. And so in that sense, you know, as the book might uh, lead you to believe, uh, Roosevelt comes out as a bit of a hero in this story, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, providing a kind of revolution in liberal democratic thinking, uh, thinking at home and abroad, um, and uh, pointing the way to what would then in the era of the Cold War be even more uh, expansive in the a way in which the liberal democracies would work together, but it was really there in the in the crisis of the 1930s that that the revolution in liberalism and liberal democracy and liberal internationalism occurred. A kind of liberal internationalism for hard times, and it's that era that I think is particularly important to look to as we uh, we look for a, a usable past, as we look for lessons. Mm -hmm. Uh, for today's today's moment. Mm -hmm. um, let's jump ahead from from Roosevelt to the end of the Cold War, because in After Victory, you know, you talked about, I mean, a brilliant book, I commend to those who've not read it, goes through all, all of the post-war settlements, uh, going back to the Congress of Vienna right through. And you talk about what was distinctive about the end of the Cold War, how it ended, um, and uh, laid out that argument. And then and now we are where we are, okay? So in a way, can you just talk about, I mean, I think that at this point, your book is going to be received in, a, in, a, in an environment and at a time when I think you'd acknowledge, uh, uh, I mean, and you, you explicitly acknowledge that there is a crisis right now about liberal internationalism as foreign policies are being renationalized around the world uh, uh, among a host of other developments. So take us through, you know, kind of that, that, that progression of how you got from the first book in your trilogy. Uh, I'm gonna guess you didn't think you'd end up at this point in the third book of, your, of, your, of what has become, a, whether it was intended or unintended trilogy. Yeah, I, you know, I do think that the, the, while the book, this current book uh, is trying to be as honest about what succeeded and what failed, in some ways the, the problems that we are coping with today are, are in some ways, a, a, problems of, of success, uh, 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 the kind of post-Cold War era of, of globalizing the liberal project. Uh, in some ways, at the very moment when the Cold War ended, there was a sense that there was no other uh, great, what, what Habermas called modernity project uh, on, on tap, uh, that, that, that it was really this kind of final settlement of what the in the great 20th century contest of of how uh, industrial societies and great powers in the world, how it would, how they would be organized. And so there was a sense of triumph, but it's in a kind of paradoxical sense, it was also the moment when the seeds of crisis were planted uh, uh, in, a, in several senses. Uh, the, 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 the liberal, uh, the, the markets and mobilization of societies and integration of societies across global space uh, accelerated this moment. Countries made transitions and joined the order, and that 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 was not. Uh, there are some who say, well, maybe if we look back, we shouldn't have invited China into the WTO. We may talk about that in our Q and A, but but in some sense, it was a kind of the next phase of kind of this liberal vision of 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 of, mm -hmm. of, of, of ever more inclusion inside of societies. The 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 vote 
going from property, you know, white male property owners to uh, males generally, the, the right for women to vote, all the different kind of movements towards more openness and inclusiveness of liberal societies. In some sense, that was mirrored on a global stage with what was this uh, sense that we are now opening up uh, the world and the, uh, the fruits of, of liberal modernity to a, to a larger uh, group of humanity. And, and that was all very good, but, but the kind of governance mechanisms uh, broke down and the kind of um, the counter movements that, that, that began to emerge. And what I argue in the book is that the, uh, the, 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 the great moments of liberal order, or liberal international order has performed most uh, effectively on the global stage when it was in some sense a subsystem, when it was a club of democracies living in a world where there were alternatives. And, uh, and so the so-called free world project countries uh, joining a, 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 a community of democracies, if you will, uh, with rights and responsibilities. It was like a like a, 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 a mutual mutual aid society. Uh, to be in was to have trade privileges and assistance mm -hmm. with security. That, with the end of the Cold War, broke down, and the liberal order became less like a club, and as I argue in the book, more like a shopping mall, where uh, everybody can kind of come in. But, and you don't have to go everywhere. You don't have to buy into, as you did before, a suite of rights and responsibilities and sign up to a set of values. You can come in and go to the Apple store, but not do anything else. So the sense of, of, of ad hoc kind of membership. And that, of course, uh, uh, degraded the governance structures, the bargains and institutions, uh, more heterogeneity to the, to the members, uh, less agreement on social purposes. And, and then, of course, you get this um, sense of, of breakdown of those threads of internationalism that I mentioned earlier that, that began to emerge and, and, and be uh, braided together in the Wilson and Roosevelt era and after World War II, becoming unbraided. So the social democratic strand, what we often call embedded liberalism, gave way but the neoliberal strand became more prominent. And so by the 2008 financial crisis, liberal internationalism looked less like it did to uh, our parents and grandparents in the 40s and 50s and 60s, and more like a platform for capitalists and bankers to do deals. So losing that lar mm -hmm. sen larger sense that we need to operate in a kind of community club-like way uh, to uh, create mechanisms for joint gain and management of our interdependence so as to let elevate the political order to, a, to an order that's, that's, that's greater than simply managing anarchy. So, so uh, that sort of higher kind of conditionality of membership and rights and responsibilities got eroded. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the task in the future, if we are going to uh, uh, reclaim the vision of liberal internationalism, is to find a way to uh, rebraid the different strands together, to make liberal internationalism more uh, useful and serv servable for uh, serviceable for, for uh, everyday people struggling with everyday problems. There are a host of people on this um, a Zoom a meeting who work on Cold War history and the end of the Cold War, and I think you'll find your your analysis uh, very relevant. I mean, they're they're persisting kind of lively debates about how that was played, of whether this uh, Clinton administration slogan of engagement and enlargement, whether it was really kind of manifest in, in U.S. actions at the time, or rather, uh, you had realists. Uh, in the 90s during the NATO expansion debate saying, just get the line as close to Russia as you can, you know, enlarge, enlarge, um, enlarge NATO. You had sort of the realists and the liberal internationalists kind of both advocating NATO expansion, but coming at it from uh, different directions. And it's sort of played out now where, you know, we're at a point, um, you know, there are books about, uh, um, will there be a uh, geostrategic crack up with China in the middle of the of this century or, or not? So um, as you've laid out the, the, the tenets of liberal internationalism, uh, 
Um, could you talk a bit about realists and, and the group you call left revisionists? Because you do engage your critics. Um, you concede a bit, but you also push back on their claims. Can you just, in terms of the uh, intellectual, uh, you know, theoretical uh, uh, landscape here, kind of differentiate um, uh, the liberal internationalist uh, kind of uh, vein of, of, of thinking from um, uh, the realist school? Yeah, um, I, I I mentioned realism already, but let me just say a little bit more about uh, the, the engagement. It's not the book is not a a kind of a, a battle between liberalism and realism. And in fact, I argue that in some sense we have slightly different enterprises. One, realism, the problems of anarchy; uh, uh, liberalism, the problems of modernity. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 even though liberals do care deeply about uh, about anarchy and and some of the great icons of realism, Morgenthau and Carr, had important things to say about how modernization of societies were altering public ethics and industrial society. And, and in the case of, of Carr, the kind of uh, viability of, of, of small nation states. So there are lots of uh, crosstalk between the traditions. I think liberals are, are, are in some sense, uh, it's, it's a more contingent theory than realism. Realism says that they can explain um, interstate relations wherever there is anarchy, ancient, modern, or elsewhere. Uh, liberal internationalism is, is a slightly more modest uh, argument that, that you wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense to talk about liberal internationalism if liberal democracies did not rise. So the, the enlightenment and the, the age of democratic revolution set the stage. I think liberals are not as certain, uh, although there's great variation between uh, different, uh, both within any existing generation of liberals and liberal internationalists about how powerful mo uh, modernity is moving us to a better world. There's, there, are, there are the end of history uh, uh, positions and there are, you, uh, you mentioned All Souls College at Oxford where I was, Isaiah Berlin's uh, uh, much more agonistic version of, of liberalism where as he says, you know, history has no libretto. We don't know what the future holds. We do know that we have values that we want to defend and uh, freedom and, and uh, so, so we, we do what we can. And uh, Judas Squar, a kind of, um, uh, a kind of uh, liberalism of fear so, so there's a lot of variation, but generally speaking, liberals are are are, uh, are perfectly willing to concede the realists that the world could be uh, driven entirely by power politics unless there are uh, are efforts by states, liberal states in particular, to build agreements and to make contracts that uh, that you have to kind of. Uh, uh, move uh, in a kind of constructive way to to overcome those those problems and um, and there's also a kind of normative uh, uh, kind of element to liberal internationalism. Uh, you you there's arguments about the way the world works, but there's also arguments about the kind of world you would like to live in. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I'm in sympathy with with those those efforts. Um, I, the the other thing I'll say, which gets us to the to what's we'll called the, the the critics on the other side, you might say the, the revisionist critics, um, uh, 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 who see uh, liberal internationalism as as failing, uh, not in managing the problems of anarchy, but failing in providing uh, social justice. That it's a kind of moral failure. Uh, it's still it's still a kind of uh, a worldview that uh, wants to promote cooperation, but it's perfectly willing to reconcile its agenda with the with global hierarchies of power and and even in the 19th century uh, racial hierarchies. Uh, just just uh, take a close look at Woodrow Wilson. Uh, my answer to that in the book is is to say yes and no. Yeah, it's, that is true, but also we confront uh, in some sense a, a paradox that liberal internationalism is simultaneously capacious as an intellectual view of the world. The world's horizons are vast. The universalisms are un, under the surface. Uh, but it's also a, a politically and shockingly a thin political project that requires others to be 
in alliance with you. And, and so liberal internationalism is not um, a, a movement that will galvanize the world on its own terms to move us to a better place. It has always had to rely on allies. And so it has moved, it was moved from the 19th century into the 20th century on the backs of nationalism, capitalism, great power politics, empire and imperialism and Anglo-American hegemony. So it's always kind of almost like a, it needs a host to rest on to help it move forward. And in that sense, this is both a strength and its weakness. It's more liberal internationalism has had a more profound impact on the modern world because it's been tied to empire and hegemony and capitalism and great power projects, but it's also made its hands dirty in some sense. It's compromised in, in various ways. And that's my answer to, to, the, to the left critics who see it as too complicitous with empire and racism, sexism. The answer is yes, it is, but it's also articulated principles that even in a deeply flawed liberal international order provide a kind of set of ideals that around which political struggles with liberal inter internationalists as allies can, can take up those struggles with others to, to bring that order closer to its ideals. So uh, that it's, a, it's a kind of, um, it's, a, it's a kind of story of, of yes and no, that it's, it's, it's never been uh, all that it might want to be. Liberal states have never, ever, no liberal state has ever acted in world affairs simply on the base of, mm -hmm. basis of liberal principles. Hypocrisy is inherent in talk about human rights and social justice. Yet it, it sets like the American system itself, it sets out ideals that are only imperfectly realized, but sets a, a kind of agenda for intergenerational uh, struggle and passing on the project to the next generation uh, with an idea that we can in fact do a little bit better I think that uh, one last comment and question before turning back over to Eric. I mean, your point about um, liberal internationalism as a framework for uh, managing a set of, of relationships and, and how it's been over time, there, there's been hypocrisy and abuses. And the Wilson Center memorializes our 28th president who while espousing liberal internationalism abroad was a segregationist at home. and. Wilson Center deals with all aspects of Wilson's legacy, including uh, that aspect of it, but he's, he's associated with liberal internationalism. You, your book doesn't, um, you address, but it's not, you didn't write your book as a debate with realism, but you framed it as sort of like anarchy and modernity. And, um, you know, realism uh, without getting into HR, you know, IR 101 territory, you know, doesn't really have an answer for a lot of questions. I mean, it describes anarchy and competitiveness among states. But when you look at the global disruptors, two of which we're living through right now, a pandemic and the harbingers of potentially ca of catastrophic, potentially existential climate change, they don't really have a good answer to that. In a sense, if we don't get as, as, a, as a biosphere, get a handle on the anarchy, there's not going to be a lot of modernity there. And in that respect, I think you've got the better part of the argument, John, about how we, a framework with the flawed history and, and the contradictions that you've outlined, but at least it's a, it's a coherent set of ideas that allow us to structure cooperation among states, recognizing that self-interest is not out the door. And we, in this country, we have America first. In Britain, it's Brexit. There are, there are counterparts to that in Russia and China. Um, it seems evident that the problems we face transcend uh, the bounds of, a, of a, any country asserting uh, that they can just uh, focus on their state sovereignty and, and tend to their own house. So within this context, and people have used, um, you know, uh, metaphors like a, a pendulum. Do you view like the pendulum on uh, kind of uh, assertive sovereignty in the, in, in the formulations we've seen from the, in the United States and China itself, et cetera? Do you see some hope for if you want to follow through on the pendulum analogy, uh, metaphor, the pendulum might swing back where there's a kind of a holy crap uh, recognition moment where everyone is saying, you know, if we don't get a handle on this as a biosphere, uh, 
We're going to fry the biosphere, and it's going to be inhabitable, you know, by the end of the twenty, 20 of this century. Do you, do you see any uh, um, any hope in that respect? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, I, I do I, I, I do see 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 hope. Uh, taking the long view is kind of how I get to that to that position. Uh, in the '30s and '40s, the you saw the kind of uh, kind of uh, breakdown of internationalism, the return of of aggressive nationalism and and fascism, and and yet there was kind of a slower evolving uh, counter movement. Uh, internationalism was being recast. I tried to tell that story a little bit today and in the book. Uh, Roosevelt was deeply uh, conscious of the uh, rising interdependence that was being manifest in the '30s. Uh, indeed, he used the term contagion. Uh, to talk about the problems of economic contagion. He used that language in his letter to the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. Uh, and in some sense, we are uh, in that world, uh, in, as you say, uh, in steroids. Uh, 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 the modernity has always been a kind of, and it's seen more, more in the Roosevelt period than the, than the Wilson period as kind of a, a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde Phenomenon. There, it, uh, uh, modernity offers great, great uh, technological wonders and uh, and possibilities for human advancement, but also for civilizational catastrophe, and uh, the Anthropocene uh, era that we're entering, the the uh, the uh, pandemics of the future, the, uh, all the kinds of, of of what used to be science fiction uh, uh, understandings of how. Uh, uh, our future may unfold, and in that light, you need more liberal internationalism than than less. You need you, realism doesn't give you any purchase. The realist lens doesn't see it. It sees states and anarchy. It doesn't see problems that uh, afflict all states and require uh, creative forms of reimagining our common space. Uh, so um, I do think that uh, there is a possibility for uh, a, a new age of, of internationalism, liberal internationalism, driven by, I think, two, two catalysts. One is the what I think we may soon see as uh, an, a narrative of failure uh, uh, of, the, of the alternative, uh, of the kind of bellicose nationalism, America first kind of uh, mentality is, is driving us to great, uh, great danger, uh, uh, physical, uh, individual danger. Our parents are endangered by this kind of way of, of thinking and acting in the world, um, uh, and so to others. And so that's one of them. And then, of course, um, so a kind of uh, danger of uh, a kind of a, an internationalism based on a, a backlash to the backlash, if you will, a counter movement. And we've always, uh, if you take the long view, had those kind of dialectics at work historically. And then, uh, so kind of looking over the abyss that if we continue on this route, we are all uh, going to suffer. And, and then I think uh, the second uh, catalyst is this uh, global warming is happening sooner than we thought. We feel it, we can see it. It's not just an abstraction. And of course, pandemics are the post poster child uh, for the the view that as as you were, if you were to boil down the essence of liberal internationalism, you cannot be secure alone. You can only be secure together. We are only as safe as the weakest link, the health systems in other countries, or quite frankly, the health system in our own country uh, has an impact on other countries. So it, it, it's a two way street, and so that kind of intellectual uh, acknowledgement that. Uh, that we've got problems to solve leads you to ideologies of international politics where problem solving is at the center of the agenda. So, so I, I'm, I, I'm bullish on uh, a, a renaissance really of internationalism uh, in, some, in some form reinvented, reimagined, uh, more pragmatic than ever before, but but uh, but there because uh, of our mutual vulnerabilities. Thank you, thank you, John, very much. Eric, over to you to uh, okay. uh, lead the discussion from here. All right. 
Thank you. Before we open this up, um, co-chair's prerogative to pose a number of my own questions, if I may. And I want to preface my first question by making it clear that I'm an historian, not a political scientist. So I would ask for your patience uh, in explaining across disciplinary boundaries uh, a number of things. And so my, my first question centers on the very term and the concept at the book center, uh, liberal internationalism and the very expansive definition you afford it or multiple definitions. Under its banner, you write at one point, its proponents have quote, championed free trade and laissez-faire as well as social democracy and the welfare state. While others have justified empire and military intervention and still others have promoted visions of global governance and the rule of law. Liberal internationalism has been used to defend racial and civilizational hierarchy and to inspire movements for self-determination and universal human rights, unquote. That's a lot of ground. If liberal internationalism is all of these things or can be all of these things, many of them at odds with one another on the list, why insist upon a single term or a single concept? Yeah, that's a great qu question, Eric. And uh, I could see somebody uh, having other, uh, doing it differently. It, it is a, a capacious term. Uh, I, I, I defend it by by arguing that it's actually the the, the opposite problem. Uh, if you narrow it, you run into the the no good uh, Scotsman fallacy that you define it by by uh, Fidelity to a, a, a dogma or a narrow set of principles that that uh, you, that that determine whether you're in or out. And I've decided that what's more interesting is to look at its its uh, tensions and contradictions and evolutions across time, and to acknowledge that under its banner, uh, uh, liberal internationalists in the 19th century have both championed. Uh, empire and at later moments and in other guises uh, uh, use those same ideas to 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 oppose empire so the, the, I, I, I try to suggest there are is a kind of core set of convictions that that bundles these different uh, strands of, of internationalism uh, open trade and exchange between societies, is mutually beneficial that liber that institutions and regimes facilitate cooperation that liberal democracies have special capacities and interests in uh, cooperation and fourthly that growing levels of and cascades of economic and security interdependence uh, require more rather than less cooperation between these states those four convictions i think are at the core of liberal internationalism the book tries to, to, to help you out a little bit, Eric, in, 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 in di disaggregating it into types of internationalism. So I've got five or six different strands of liberal internationalism uh, that emerge in the 19th century that get bound together in the Wilson era. And I talk about imperial internationalism, Westphalian internationalism as two kind of uh, macro uh, forms of of thinking about uh, about international order that uh, are kind of uh, are kind of alternatives that liberal internationalism has had to navigate. So liberal internationalism across the last two centuries has moved uh, its projects from a world of empire to a world of nation states. So in the last two hundred years, the world has been has moved from one ordering principle empire as late as the end of the 19th century 70 percent of the world's population lived in empires to the end of the 20th century when nobody did and that transformation occurred across two centuries when liberal internationalists from john locke to john stuart mill to richard cobden to john hobson to all those who came later were making arguments about how liberal democracies should operate, whether they should be working with or against empire, uh, uh, um, and, and how far do you go? So you have, you might call them social democratic liberals who emerge in the, in, in the, uh, in the um, uh, progressive era, and then again in the New Deal era, and then again in the Great Society era, and more kind of uh, 
uh, straight down kind of uh, laissez-faire liberals. So there's, there, I think we're just in that world where the ideas are, uh, there's no settled core and the arguments among those who are internationalists who do start the conversation with liberal democracy and what they need to do in the world and then it opens up and it evolves and the inter strands of internationalism get braided together and fall apart. So that's the way I, I try to grapple with your very important question, which is it is a huge intellectual and political landscape in which to find the, the ideas and, and trace them, their lineages and genealogy across time. Thank you. Let me hone in on the chapter on empire, if we, we can talk about that for a moment. And I was struck by the what I saw as the extensive credit um, given to liberal internationalism for inspiring and coming to support anti-imperialism and decolonization. And even if Western democracies didn't live up to the ideals and principles that they preached, once those principles, as you put it, entered into the discourse, they became part of the ideological landscape upon which political struggles are waged, unquote. No argument. The role played by the communist bloc and or communist ideology, granted this is not your subject in the book, I know, it, it seems quite minimal in comparison. Uh, and so am I reading that correctly? And could uh, one imagine an alternative framing uh, that credits the Soviets and Chinese and other communists for doing as much or even more to inspire and support national liberation struggles whatever their outcome, than liberal internationalists. If you could just talk a little bit more about the communist role. Yeah, well, I, 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 my short answer will be no, but I'll give you a slightly longer answer. Um, I, I think that my book, my book chapter on liberalism and empire is kind of, on the one hand, liberals have, have been, been entangled in arguments for empire, but that those that, that entanglement, liberal entanglement with empire, is contingent. To use Duncan Bell's, uh, the intellectual historian's term, uh, uh, not inherent or fundamental. That it's been on both sides, and I, I the, that chapter is not telling the full story of, of the of the of the movement from empire to nation state from imperial forms of order to self-determination and state sovereignty in the Westphalian system. So in that sense, it's not telling the Soviet story. But were I to tell more of the Soviet story, I, 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 I code the Soviet Union as an empire. Uh, it, I, I, in, in the East Bloc was a hierarchical order that didn't have liberal characteristics. Uh, it was very different as, as Cold War scholars like uh, John Gaddis tell us very eloquently, it had a different uh, form of, uh, of, 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 of hegemonic structure that, that tilted towards empire. Yes, uh, it's true that, uh, that the kind of contestation in the, in the third world, you might call it, in the world that, that was not inside of either the Soviet bloc or the Western Bloc was one where both uh, superpowers were seeking uh, allies and seeking to undermine the affiliations of those states with the other rival Bloc. So there, there's no question, and there's also no question that that independent seeking uh, leaders and, and independence movements in, in in Africa and Asia and elsewhere. Uh, uh, did uh, tie and define their struggle and, and frame their struggle in, in kind of Marxist, uh, communist, uh, national liberation terms. Others didn't. Um, uh, so there, there is a kind of multiple stories there. And, and I think you know more about that as a historian than I do. Um, but I, I, I think that there really isn't uh, any moral comparison given the, the sort of the story of freedom, self-determination, rule by the people between the Soviet project and we'll call it the American liberal project, beginning with America's founding. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, and the preamble to the Constitution, uh, up to, the, to the preamble to the Declaration of Independence and Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and the, the, the connection of America's um, identity with, with this kind of unfolding struggle, uh, uh, I think in the, in the long kind of fullness of history looks like it has been a more inspiring and consequential bulwark for uh, countries seeking, uh, uh, seeking escape from empire than anything the Soviets answered, full stop. Um, and so um, in so many different ways from the emergence of Latin American republics in the, in the late 19th century, um, the, the efforts of, of, um, of W.E.D. Du Bois, the great American, uh, uh, African-American uh, civil rights uh, uh, intellectual from the first half of the 20th century, he actually tied his hopes on, on Woodrow Wilson, not Lenin. Um, and uh, the later post-World War II efforts at, uh, uh, at, at building more uh, independent authority in the developing world to, for purposes of pursuing independence occurred uh, through organizations like the Bandung me, me, movement that sought to replicate the Atlantic Charter ideals, not Communist Party ideals. So I, I think I would, would, would defend the overweighting, you might say, in the book on those grounds. Thank you. I would just add that Du Bois ended his life in 1963, very close to the communists. Um, uh, it was a, a very interesting, you know, political uh, journey uh, that he undertook uh, over the course of the 20th century. Um, we have a question that came in um, um, via email, uh, and I'm going to tie it to my last question. Uh, and from Herman Cohen, a retired U.S. ambassador, uh, he asks: Is it accurate to say? that the large disparities in wealth that we see in the US and other Western democracies these days are a reflection of Western capitalism's ability to minimize the majority's desire to share in economic growth. And I would tie this to your final chapter where you address the rough waters that liberal internationalism has encountered of late. Uh, the concept, concept you said is deeply tied uh, to the domestic and social and economic agendas of liberal democracy. But the erosion of progressive coalitions and progressive social policies by neoliberalism, including deregulation, deregulation and the global integration of capital markets, this has increased inequality in the US and in Europe. This is from the, toward the end of the book. And so at the moment, a reversal of this trend toward inequality doesn't seem to be on the horizon. So if these coalitions remain weak and inequality, deep inequality persi persists, how can liberal internationalism regain the strength that it has lost? Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you to the ambassador as well. Uh, I, I do think that um, the, 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 the domestic, the, 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 the conditions inside of capitalist societies today are, have deteriorated uh, the uh, the the uh, rising inequality and the uh, we're really at a at a generational moment where in many of the certainly Western societies more generally the kind of advanced industrial societies the next generation is is really going to be the first generation in a long time that won't do better than their parents so there's a sense of of secular kind of stagnation uh, and and I, I sort of just a under, underline something you said that I tried to argue in the end of the book that looking back over 200 years, the best moments for cooperation generally, but liberal international cooperation in particular, was tied to a kind of agenda of, of progressive domestic movement, whether it was the progressive movement of, of Teddy Roosevelt and Wilson, the New Deal, the Great Society, the, the, even before that in the 19th century, the era of what we often called reform liberalism. Um, and 
I guess you'd have to say that the, the, the burden of my argument is that if you don't get a handle on that today, it's going to be very hard to have a, a fully functioning liberal international order again. I, I, I do think that's the weak link and that's where we need to see some kind of movement. I, I, I don't know. I can't, I, I can't, I, I can't, um, um, can't quite see how all the pieces will come together to get us to that point. But I do think that what I, what on the, the international side, what the liberal project needs to do is remind those who are in these conflicts over ideologies and, and political projects, national and international, that um, liberal internationalism is not a project of globalizing the world, it is a project for managing our mutual interdependence. And so I would be just as happy if the word globalization never were uttered in the presence of a liberal internationalist. Uh, and I would likewise try to, to, to suggest that as I do at the end when I talk a little bit about Danny Roderick's argument about how after a certain point, greater economic integration between states has less efficiency gains and more uh, inequality implications. Uh, uh, and so that, that for every greater increment of integration going forward, we get less of the former, uh, more of the latter. And so it, it creates more inequality and we can do a lot. And that in the end, the liberal project, liberal international project needs to be that as we manage and maybe reassert some government control over uh, building a, a fair domestic economy for each of us, that uh, we uh, uh, not pursue a kind of race to the bottom mercantilism, but, but adhere to some liberal principles like non-discrimination, most favored nation, and multilateral kind of uh, mechanisms for adjudication. So, uh, that's not necessarily an answer to your question, but I do think that that um, until we tack back in the other direction, fair tax code and kind of reassert kind of our, uh, and rebuild the kind of the social contract, as I said earlier, making internationalism something that is good for everyday people and everyday problems. Uh, that's a slogan, I agree. I don't have a lot of uh, uh, agenda behind it, except that I think serious people are working on it and uh, new political movements will come along and young people are thinking about things differently. And in some sense, the, the crisis that we're in, as in previous crises, in some sense have had to become so acute so that we can actually think once again about first principles. Uh, and we may be getting to that point where uh, cr crazy ideas about about uh, the social contract might might uh, sound less crazy today as we look for, for uh, to reassert you know values of fairness and sharing and, and mutual and mutual assistance. Thank you. Now let's open this up to question and answers. But first. Uh, just a heads up, uh, toward the end of the session, uh, there will be a link uh, for a flyer uh, about with purchase information from Yale University Press uh, that will be visible um, um, uh, on the screen. So uh, if you're interested in purchasing the book at a discount, keep your eyes open for that, uh, uh, for that flyer, that information. With question and answers, if you could use your uh, raise hand function uh, on Zoom, uh, or uh, if you want to email us, uh, rweekly uh, at historians.org. Uh, we will attempt to get uh, to as many folks as we can. There's been a hand in the queue uh, that's been up for a while from Leon Fink. Uh, Leon, if you would unmute yourself, you can ask a question. You have to unmute yourself. Bottom left. Okay, work on that. We'll get back to you in a moment. Uh, next in the queue is 
and forgive me for my pronunciation here, uh, De Lai. If you would unmute yourself, you may speak. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Eckenberry. You said that the word globalization, globalization never appeared in the language of liberal internationalists. So uh, I'm wondering, what do you think about the paper title Global Globalization, What's New, What's Not, by Bob Kuhin and Joseph Nye? Well, um, I didn't say that globalization isn't in the language. It certainly has been. I, I was trying to say that uh, the, um, the, uh, the ideology of globalization uh, is, is, is not something that uh, brings us closer to the, to the kind of the, the, uh, the pragmatic framing of what the project of liberal internationalism is. It's not about globalizing the world, it's about managing our uh, economic and security interdependence. And so it's partly my effort to pull the, the framing of this tradition back uh, to what I think it, its core is and what I think it's been when it's been most successful. Uh, there are those who have written about globalization brilliantly that in some sense use the language uh, and, and but mean it in the way I do so that I'm not saying it needs to be extinguished entirely, but the, the, it's the underlying concept that I want to emphasize. Uh, professors Nye and Kohane are, are, have done uh, pathbreaking work on interdependence, and I build on their work and, and am humbled by what they've done intellectually to illuminate uh, the nature of international politics. Uh, so I, I think that uh, what in particular relating to this book, I think the, 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 what, what they and, and I think uh, several other leading figures of that of, the, of their generation have, have helped teach us are uh, how to think about uh, interdependence. They, they coined the term complex interdependence. Um, others have used the term uh, density, uh, interaction density, uh, uh, ways of trying to get at how our societies are tied to each other and what that means for our common fate. So I, I guess I would say um, in the kind of analytic construction of, 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 of theory uh, about interdependence, that work is, is, a, is very important and I associate myself with it. Thank you. We have a question that has come in um, from Facebook uh, that goes as follows. Do you believe that the post-Cold War era unleashed missionary international liberalism, failed regime change, experiments, sanctions, et cetera, to its own disadvantage? And is there some way that international liberalism can re-embrace the exemplarist mode, which seems to me Woodrow Wilson had in mind when he intentionally used the passive and personal construction uh, in his famous speech, the world must be made safe for democracy? Yes, that's part of what I I'm trying to do in this in this book, and and to 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 to, to try to remind readers and, and the public uh, scholars that that the tradition, the liberal tradition, is not simply a a program for military interventionism. Um, and so, and indeed, I, in my chapter on liberalism and empire, I have a, a little segment uh, where I, I talk about the Iraq war, which for some realists, uh, uh, Mearsheimer and others, there's a, a sense that that's a liberal war. And I dispute that. I think that that was really more about um, great power politics hegemony that uh, was really uh, not a story of, of uh, spreading democracy, although that became part of the, the rhetoric for the for the larger campaign. And I've written about that pretty um, uh, in, in great detail with, with my longtime uh, co-author, co Dan Dubny. Um, so uh, I, just, I just say a, a little bit about um, uh, the, the post-World War, post-Cold post War expansion of liberalism and the implication of the question was that uh, 
the Cold War ended, the adversaries and the enemies of liberal, liberal internationalism and liberal democracy uh, disappeared. And all of a sudden, liberals were out pushing their, their model onto others. Uh, it, it's a little bit more complicated than that. There was a huge amount of demand side uh, movement, uh, uh, integration. Countries were eager for more rather than less uh, integration into this liberal order. People wanted to join the club. Countries uh, uh, from, from uh, South Korea to Eastern Europe to Southern Europe to Latin America were making various kinds of transitions and wanted to be part of this framework that would allow them to gain markets and mechanisms for, for assistance and access to the rules and norms of a expanding world economy. So it wasn't simply a missionary story. In fact, I don't think that was the dominant impulse. I think it was it was as much this kind of sense of, 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 of there was no other kind of logic for organizing world order in the wake of the Cold War, and this was the only game in town. Yes, there was overreach. Yes, there was a, an overestimation that the deep forces of modernity would, as Wilson may have thought in his time, envelop the world and move towards a, a convergence. Uh, indeed, China uh, might well um, uh, uh, move in this direction. And there was a lot of uh, hope that, uh, that, that China would uh, liberalize and integrate and become a stakeholder, to use the, the, the phrase of Robert Zellick. And, and I think it was the, the right bet to make, and I don't think it was entirely a wrong, uh, a failed bet. I think that uh, the, when you think about the alternative, think about the counterfactual, what would you have done if you would have, at the end of the Cold War, begun to build your wall, a Trumpian wall to leave uh, and leave uh, China on the other side? Uh, would we have a China that would be as willing to tackle problems of global warming as we do today? Would we have a China that would be as willing to tackle uh, non-proliferation uh, goals, uh, uh, refugees, peacekeeping at the United Nations? So I, China may not be everybody's perfect global citizen. So the United States certainly isn't today. But I don't think building the wall uh, at the moment when we were tearing down a wall, the Berlin Wall, would have been the better strategy. Uh, even though you might say the liberal bet was not fully realized yet. Thank you. Um, Rob, I think you have a question uh, to, to interject here. We need to unmute you. Hold on. Rob Litvak, are you okay? There we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the the, the uh, eternal question of, of Zoom meetings, you know, can you hear me? Um, uh, to which the obvious answer is those who cannot hear you obviously will not reply. So, um, uh, uh, John, um, just like to probe a little further in terms of where we're at right now. I mean, and this is a group, there are a fair number of historians here. Uh, Ernest May and others, you know, talked about like different models for how war started, World War I, uh, inadvertent escalation, World War II, kind of, uh, a, you know, the Hitler um, uh, uh, autocratic model of, of expansion, and now we're into where we're at. It seems, and um, uh, this is a little preview of a talk I'm going to give on my, my publication, Managing Nuclear Risks on Friday, is that we're in a situation where you see both 1914 and 1962 coming into play together that you've got territorial disputes between nuclear weapon states. I mean, India, Pakistan, 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 Israel, India. I mean, they fought that border clashes in 1919, 1920. China has this assertive declaration of sovereignty in the South and East China Sea. Uh, these are not kind of peripheral stakes to the Chinese and where US and Chinese naval forces come into operation. So the 1914 concerns are certain evident there as well as in Europe where Russia for the first time, you know, changed the territorial status quo with the occupation and annexation of Crimea and what it's doing in East Ukraine, uh, hybrid operations and the Baltic states. So you sort of see the 1914 component of it there. 
And then the 1962 component comes in because the arms control architecture, it's being dismantled, like the, the new START treaty is probably, odds are will not be uh, extended. You've got in a multipolar nuclear system, new states that have not been brought in uh, to any type of arms control architecture. So you have sort of uh, this combination of potential for inadvertent escalation arising from territorial clashes combined with nuclear balances that are um, not as stable as you would hope they would be in terms of having a mutual deterrent situation. This combination of 1914, 1962 seems uh, pretty, uh, to use the technical social science term, hairy, if you ask me. So what is, uh, I'd be interested in your take on that. Yeah, well, um, it sounds like I'm gonna have to write another book. Um, uh, so uh, this will um, be kind of trying to extend some of, of, of my ideas. And I guess the, the first thing I would say is um, what you describe is frightening and, and it is out there uh, at the kind of great power uh, security competition level that, that is increasing in its intensity and in its danger. Um, whether it's China and its ex expansionary uh, ambitions in the South China Sea and the worrisome uh, dynamics uh, with kind of erosion of deterrence with, uh, of, the ta of Taiwan across the straits. Um, uh, the, uh, and then India, uh, China, I think, you know, the, the I, I don't have, uh, solutions that that jump uh, uh, immediately out of the book uh, other than the message that I, I I spend some time just talking about at the end of the book about how do how do the, the liberal democratic states deal with illiberal states like China and Russia and the the argument that I make the historical argument is that you get all these different um, alternative ways of trying to deal with with uh, illiberal states that may be engaged in security competition with you to absorb them to invite them into your club to uh, to seek a uh, uh, mutual uh, sort of uh, mutual uh, uh, mutual um, survival and uh, and and then of course on the other side uh, uh, regime change and efforts to to to, to turn them into democracies. The liberal internationalists across the, the last hundred years have made all those arguments. What I think comes most clearly to the surface when we look at, at the historical record and look how past uh, liberal democracies have dealt with moments like this, the, and you've mentioned some of the moments, having a kind of a, a collective sense of leadership and grand strategy in the face of security competition and arms racing, breakdown of arms control, all of that in some sense requires us, if we're gonna address those problems, to rebuild U US European relations, to, uh, to um, uh, stabilize ex the system of extended uh, deterrence, uh, to relaunch arms control, which um, is, 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 is clearly on the other side of this breakdown of order that you're describing. And, uh, um, you know, I, I think of, of, of George Kennan's long telegram at the end of, the, uh, of that long telegram, he, he makes the comment that is often forgotten, and that is that uh, the, the struggle with illiberal adversaries who are not likely to immediately come to the table and do deals, uh, the, the, the longer struggle is to maintain your own, uh, the health and welfare of your own block, of your own grouping of states, uh, to keep it legitimate and not to simply mirror the uh, illiberalism of your adversaries. So I, can't, I, I think the first step is, is where the liberal internationalists will be most helpful, which is rebuilding uh, coalitions of, of, of like-minded states 
Um, I, I talk in the foreign affairs article about a, a kind of D10 uh, of high, high capacity democracies uh, working as kind of drivers for re, restarting uh, 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 and rebuilding international institutions and agreements from climate change to, to UN reform, to WHO, to arms control. And so having a strong, coherent, mutually respectful group of grouping of states seems to be where you start. No, none, none of the problems you're suggesting, Rob, can really uh, be addressed without that kind of sort of re rebuilding of the alignments that will precede diplomacy and hopefully uh, a, a kind of a return to to uh, reciprocal based arms control restraint. We have a question that has come in um, via email, I believe. Um, how does the United States' ambivalent, to be generous, relationship with the ICC, the International Criminal Court, fit into your understanding of liberal internationalism? This from Francine Hirsch, who we'll be hearing from a number of weeks from now when she presents on her book. Yeah, I think that's a great question, and I, I will look forward to tuning in for that because uh, I, I, I want to learn more about uh, from those who have studied it in depth. Uh, it, it, I guess what I would start with the general point that that the U.S. There's kind of the again I'm I'm kind of uh, making a a distinction between the liberal international tradition and America. So I'm not I'm not writing a book about America. This is not a, this is a book about a tradition that that America and other countries have have brought into their foreign policy in various ways, never completely and never fully to the exclusion of other impulses, realist or otherwise. So the first point is I is that that um, the US as a great power has done all sorts of things that look like it that have fallen into all sorts of different traditions of, of behavior. Uh, aggressive realism, defensive realism, isolationism, neoconservatism, and liberal internationalism. And the US has been, as I think uh, you're suggesting, uh, ambivalent more generally about tying itself to international institutions. The US has always been a kind of ambivalent institution builder. It wants other countries to, to adhere to international rules and institutions while the US gains the benefits from that and and only selectively and and when it can control the agenda do so itself so the us is a, a kind of paradoxical state where it has done more as a great power across a century to promote a, a world of, of rules and institutions but at the same time been very reluctant certainly ambivalent about uh, giving up sovereignty and and operating inside those institutions. The WTO, it's it's the, it, where it pre-commits to dispute settlement outcomes. It, it, it has a record of, of compliance until recently. Um, so too in primarily in, in trade areas, it's been very uh, reluctant to to sign on to the ICC. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, it's taken its name off, uh, uh, even though it's signed and uh, under under uh, Clinton, it, it, it has name taken off. I think John Bolton took its name off the uh, uh, from, from off the the, the, the treaty. Um, I I think that um, the liberal internationalism that has thrived over the last two centuries has has tended to be more intergovernmental than global judicial. Um, uh, the, the, there, there was a kind of arbitration movement in the 19th century that was seen as very um, constitutive of, of, of liberal internationalism that fed into the Wilson era. Uh, 
but it tended to be um, voluntary. States could bring disputes to, to tribunals uh, on their own and would accept, you know, would accept them if they wanted to. This kind of voluntarist style uh, has fit into the larger American tradition. Um, and just the final thing I'll say about this is, uh, is that obviously the United States has, has not been a, a, a good citizen in these, uh, these kind of high, high uh, law uh, commissions such as the ICC. In some ways, it's, it's been this, this other kind of slightly weaker tradition of internationalism that has reigned, as I suggested, with arbitration and with uh, the kind of the epitome of it, I would say, is uh, captured in uh, Elihu, Elihu Root's um, uh, uh, tenure as Secretary of State in the uh, in the period before Wilson, and at the uh, Second Hague uh, Conference in 1907, when the American Secretary of State, who had been Pre the first president of the International Law Association, he wrote a um, instructions to the American de delegation to the Hague Co Convention of, 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 of 1907. And in those instructions to the American delegates, he said something along the lines of, we are going to try to get agreements on, 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 on uh, issues that we care about, uh, and we won't get everything we want but we will establish a kind of working relationship and a baseline that will then be used later on for more agreements. So this kind of ratcheting up, getting used to agreements, socializing ourselves into uh, uh, international legal uh, communities. So it's, it's slightly this more kind of voluntaristic, um, uh, bottom up, um, We'll do what we can, but we aren't going to commit ourselves to the point that we will totally rupture our relationship with the outside uh, system of international law. So that's that's how international relations scholars have tended tended to, to try to see both the deep sources of, of ambivalence, but despite that ambivalence, some kind of uh, ratcheting, uh, small steps compromise movement forward. Thank you very much. And I unfortunately have to draw this event to a close. I suspect we could go on for quite some time this evening, uh, but I wanna thank John and Rob, as well as those of you posing questions from the audience and my apologies to those of you with questions that we could not get to. Uh, stand by uh, on the screen uh, looking for information about uh, the discount code uh, for the book, should you wish to purchase it from Yale University Press. And if you see in the chat function uh, another event, uh, uh, in this case with Rob Litvak and his new book, Managing Nuclear Risks, that'll be taking place this Friday. Uh, October 9th uh, at the Wilson Center, uh, and the link uh, to information uh, about that event for registering and RSVPing uh, is, is uh, there uh, on the screen. The Washington History Seminar returns uh, a week from this Wednesday on October 14th at 4 p.m., uh, our next installment, uh, webinar installment, which will feature historian Julia Rose Kraut on her new book, Threat of Dissent, a History of Ideological Exclusion and Deportation in the United States. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and until our next session, take care and stay safe.